Okay, welcome back uh, to the break. Just before we uh, went for our break, we were looking at the first uh, covenant uh, messianic prophecy uh, in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Okay, and we're looking at the last phrase in that um, verse, verse 15, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's basically talking about that the seed of the woman, okay, uh, which means that, you know, Jesus is referring here to Jesus, okay, uh, who came as a human being born uh, to a virgin, okay, will crush the head of the serpent. Bruise here means crush the head of serpent. And uh, we see that Jesus did that on the cross. Okay, we read about this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. So can one of you please read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 18, please? Or just can read, yeah, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 to 18. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who that is the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so verse 14 says that, you know, um, through his death, he destroyed the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, so he uh, disarmed every principality and power. Uh, he, you know, uh, you know, he nullified all of the powers of the uh, evil one. We see in Hebrews chapter four, verses fourteen, uh, verse fourteen. Uh, so here, the seed refers to he will he will bruise his head. It's referring to Jesus. Okay, it also can refer to. Us collectively, because I said that he stands, he or his could also stand for it and they. It can also stand for the people of God. Okay, how do we know that? If you look at um, uh, uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 20, can somebody read that, please? Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Romans 16, 20. Romans 16, verse uh, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay, so here Paul is talking to the church at Rome. He's saying, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet, which means, you know, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, uh, you know, he has given, he has shared his victory with the body of Christ, which is the church. Uh, God in his grace is using his church, the body of Christ today to carry out his plans and his purpose. And how do we crush Satan? How do we destroy Satan? Through the spiritual weapons that God has uh, given us, because the word of God says our uh, weapons are not physical, but spiritual. Okay, and they are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Okay, so Jesus shares his victory with us. And, uh, you know, even though he has won the victory on the cross, okay, over Satan, but we still see that Satan is not, you know, um, uh, is not fully done away with. Okay, that is why it says he will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Okay, ultimately Satan will be completely defeated in the, in the end time when he will be thrown into the bottomless pit, which is he'll be thrown into hell. But in the meantime, even though he has been disarmed of all his powers, but he can trick us to show us that he's more powerful, that he is um, in control of our lives, uh, just by talking things that are lies, that can be very manipulative, that can be deceptive, and we can easily get into his uh, deception. So here it's important to note that, you know, uh, the seed of the woman here in verse, look at your Bibles, please. Okay, the figurative sense, we're talking about the seed of the woman. He shall, the seed is referring to both Jesus Christ and to 
uh, human beings. Okay, the small seed can also be demons, but also literally referring to human beings. He shall bruise your head. Christ has already crushed the head of Satan, but also the he can refer to collectively or singularly. So collectively, it can in include the people of God because we are on a day-to-day -day basis you know, engaging in spiritual warfare where we are crushing Satan um, because he is going to bruise our heel. That means it talks here about, you know, an ongoing enmity between Satan and mankind, okay? So there are two kinds of enmity that we see here, which we need to, uh, you know, it's an important fact. When mankind sinned and fell into sin, we became enemies of God, okay, and we became slaves of Satan, okay. So when uh, when um, when mankind sinned, we became enemies of God, and we became slaves of uh, Satan, okay. So here, this verse is basically also implying that it is because of the seed who would come in the form of a human being, okay. Uh, 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 who will crush the head of the ser Satan. That means the Messiah will uh, defeat Satan through his work on the cross. And that has made possible for us to be reconciled back to God. Okay. So we have been reconciled back to God. Now we can crush Satan. Where is Satan? Under our feet. Yes. <laughs> Somebody is very boldly saying that under our feet. Okay, so this has been possible through the work of Jesus Christ. Okay, so that is why this whole passage is talking about this, this is the first messianic prophecy, proto evangel, the first gospel which is preached by God, was talking about the Messiah who would come and who would, uh, and it's also the first of the basis of the all other redemptive covenants. That means covenants are talking about our redemption. That means the price. Redemption means what? What is the meaning of redemption? You redeem something by paying the price. Okay, so suppose you go and keep a gold ornament in the shop and, you know, uh, you because you don't have money and you want to redeem it, you have to go and pay the uh, price and now you have to pay the interest for it and then you can take back what is yours. So Jesus redeemed us from sin and Satan and the power of sin and death by paying by his very life, his precious blood. He laid down his very life. So that is, uh, this is about uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 14 and 15. It's talking about the Edenic covenant. Okay, any questions anyone has on this? Genesis 3, 14 and 15. Okay. Yes, Rin. Please take the mic. So Rin says a uh, question. Another thing that I want to say is the serpent will bruise his heel uh, and you will crush his uh, head. Okay. It's an ongoing enmity. Uh, I didn't forgot to say the second part of it. The second part of it is, you know, after we've been redeemed, even though we become enemies of God, when we believe in Jesus Christ, accept him, we're redeemed out from uh, Satan you know, redeemed from sin and death. But then also we become, we become enemies of Satan. And Satan is looking continually to, uh, you know, um, uh, to harm us, okay, bruising our heel, but we can crush his head. So we need to know what authority that we have received because of the new covenant that we are part of, okay? Yes. Yes, Rick. Uh, so, Pastor, uh, when Jesus, he like he died on the cross, and um, this line where it says, "He will, he shall bruise your head." So, um, closer, yes, he shall bruise your head. Okay, he shall bruise his head. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know that Jesus defeated Satan when he went on the cross, but why didn't he like get completely defeated? He still has that same dominion over us on this earth. He is completely defeated. He has no dominion and power over us unless you give him the opportunity and the uh, room and consider him. Uh, but he is always there to tempt us, uh, you know, but uh, by, you know, by lies and all of those things. 
by reminding us of our past or saying that if you do this, you'll get a curse upon yourself. It's lies that we believe of the enemy. But we need to, that's why we need to know our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, where we are seated. We are spiritually seated in the, you know, we uh, in Romans chapter 6, Paul is talking about our identification, you know, our identification in Christ. You know, he says when you are uh, when you are born again, you're dead to sin, and he's talking about who their idea, what is their identity, and he can and he uh, you know he links their identity with the 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 uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension, and the seating of Jesus in the heavenly realm. So spiritually. Spiritually, when we are born again, we identify with all of these things. We identify with Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection, his uh, ascension, him being seated at the right hand of God. But that should become a reality in the physical. Okay, that is why we talk about this when we uh, when we go for baptism. Bap baptism is also identifying spiritually with what Jesus has done. His you know his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, and his seating again. So now you know spiritually when you're born again, where are you seated? The right hand of God, which means what? You have authority over all demonic forces and realms and powers. And so you utilize your God-given authority and power that you have. Okay, so Satan is there. He's not fully, uh, you know, uh, Satan is full, totally disarmed. His his power is nullified. But for those who are not born again, his, you know, still makes them by deceiving them and cheating them. But then ultimately, yes, uh, you know, he's going to be thrown into the bottomless pit where he'll be ultimately fully uh, defeated. But already he's a defeated foe, which means, you know, we don't say, okay, then Christ's work is not full sufficient. Uh, it is a full sufficient perfect sacrifice that he made. Everything is done and completed, okay? But only thing Satan has to be thrown into the bottomless pit. Yes. Yes. Please take the mic quickly. Please pass it on quickly. You can move and... Ma'am, what uh, your you will bruise his heel means like how oh, we can see it. You will bruise his heel. Where does uh, the snake usually come and uh, where does he come and uh, attack us? Heel, right? Yeah, heel is here yeah, near your feet. Yes. You will bruise his heel is basically talking about, see, you will look at it all in a figurative sense. Okay, it's talking about where say, a serpent will come and hurt us, but it doesn't mean that certain is, Satan is going to come and, you know, tap us in our heel or, you know, dislocate our ligament or give us a ligament tear or bone near our heel. It's basically talking about a figurative sense, an ongoing enmity between uh, 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 the children of God and Satan. No, it's talking about Jesus and it's, I said, singular and collective. It's figuratively singular and collective. But basically, where do we, as a, as a ch children of God, where do we get the power to overcome Satan? We didn't have that power, right? It's because of the seed who died on the cross. And it's talking about uh, Jesus. And uh, like I said, it's referring, we looked at, uh, uh, you know, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 18. By his death, he destroyed him who had the power of death. That is the death. Please hold the mic so that others can. Yeah. Can we paraphrase it or say it? Say this was like that. Like a uh, enemy comes uh, to bruise our heel, but by what Jesus has uh, done for us, we can bruise his head. Yes, we have the power and authority because of Christ's finished work on the cross. Yes. Okay. You can give it to him. He has a question. And if our online students have any questions, go ahead and type it out in the chat section or you can unmute and speak. Yes. Uh, this is the first question. I'm like, bruise his heel means, uh, can we consider it like, uh, I mean, uh, uh, by Saturn bruises, bruises uh, with the worldly things and all? Like, we yeah, can. Temptations, basically. Temptation. It's an ongoing enmity between him and us. 
Uh, and the other thing is, uh, you told that uh, there is an enmity between the people who are ungodly and people who are godly. How we consider this enmity in be between the ungodly? No, not enmity between the ungodly and the godly. Here I'm talking about the small seed. Yeah, I mean, talk about the, uh, you said like in the seed, uh, norm, small letter seed, and when you're comparing this seed, seed and seed, you told that the enmity between this uh, ungodly people and the people who the small seed can refer to demons or also to the uh, you know to those who are ungodly. I mentioned. And what is the enmity between the ungodly people and ungodly? ungodly? people yeah. there is we don't we don't we don't see each other on 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 equal terms in in what we believe in what we do godly people means gentiles ma'am or uh... no 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 ungodly people means those who who i said the fa whose father is the devil who do evil okay i thought ungodly, ungodly people means gentiles. Evil. yes uh, evil people who whose father is satan yes anyone has any other questions Okay, no, if no, we we'll move on to uh, the next covenant which God makes. Uh, here we're talking about, you know, the, the prophecies relating to Christ's birth. Okay, so the first one we looked, Genesis chapter 3. The next one we look at Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. So can somebody please read that? Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Okay, so here uh, God is reconfirming his covenant with whom? With Abraham. Okay, what does he say earlier to Abraham when he makes a covenant with Abraham? You, you remember what he says? Earlier when he makes a covenant with Abraham, you know, the first few instances, what does he say? Through you, all the generations or families or the nations of the world will be blessed okay genesis chapter 12 verse 3 okay in you all the families of the earth will be blessed but look at what G what god is uh, saying in genesis chapter 22 which is actually reconfirming the covenant which he makes with abraham what does he say, say here in your in your seed and the seed is singular or plural singular it's not talking in your seeds, which means we can say in the in your generations to come, you know, or in your descendants. It's here is talking about seed, but what is the seed? Capital S or small s? Small s, but actually here, you know, it is talking about the promise of the coming of the Messiah. Okay, so this is also part of God's covenant to Abraham. Where God is promising that through Abraham's seed, not talking about through Abraham's seed, meaning Isaac, okay, which is his seed, but here a uh, uh, descendant, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, is basically referring here to um, the Messiah. How do we know that it's here referring to Messiah? Because Paul in the New Testament, he's writing to the church at Galatia, okay, Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 10. 8 and 16. So can one of you please quickly read Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and 16. And the, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made, promises made. He does not say, and two seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So here very clearly, Paul is mentioning and referring to what we read in Genesis chapter 22, verse 18. Where that's, and, and Paul is saying, it does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but it's talking about one, which means, and to your seed, and in your seed and he's saying this seed is whom christ so this his seed here basically indicates that god was speaking about christ himself okay uh, and the american standard version reads and in thy seed shall all the nations bless themselves thy seed okay so this implies that all the nations of the earth 
you know, whether they are Jews or Gentiles, will be based, will, uh, will receive justification or be made righteous or receive salvation. How? Not by works, but by grace. By grace through faith. Okay, through faith by grace or by grace through faith. Okay, so what actually Paul is trying to bring about here, he's saying that, hey, you know, uh, the Jews were, you know, causing a lot of problem in the early church. When the Jews were becoming Christians, when they're coming into the church, they were saying, you know, you don't just receive salvation by uh, just believing in Jesus Christ, but you have to follow the circumcision ritual. They're telling the Gentiles, you have to eat certain kind of food you have to keep certain kind of days the rituals everything which the jews followed and that was becoming a problem on the on the um, on the uh, gentiles and it was kind of causing a lot of disturbance in the in the church and so they were trying to lead the church very subtly the way satan was kind of bringing in this lies that righteousness or justification or salvation is not just by grace but by or by faith but it is by works okay so here and also in 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 the book of romans uh, you know paul is saying you know, hey, even before Abraham received the circumcision ritual, he was justified, he was made righteous by faith. Because Abraham believed by faith and he was made righteous. So what Paul is saying is, hey, you don't have to follow the circumcision ritual, keep the circumcision ritual for you to be to come under the covenant and receive the Abrahamic blessings. But he's saying, all of you Gentiles can receive this blessing or come under uh, the blessing of Abraham by your faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. By grace through faith. Okay. So that is how you receive it. So very beautifully, he discusses this and he brings about this whole Old Testament thing. And in that concept, his con uh, context, he's talking about the seed here. And he's saying that, hey, you will not receive the promise of Abraham or you will not come under the covenant of Abraham because you are under the, you are one of the descendants or the generations or in the born in the lineage of Abraham. But even though you are not a descendant of Abraham, you are a Gentile by birth, you can still receive because the seed that is referring to here is not seeds but seed and it's talking about Jesus Christ and it's by faith in Jesus Christ that you receive and it's a free gift by grace you receive it so very beautifully he presents it so all of the nations whether Jews and Gentiles can come under the Abrahamic covenant can receive this blessing why because of Jesus okay because of Jesus's birth God becoming man dying on the cross defeating Satan, making that new covenant which we are part and freely giving it to us. It's by grace through faith. So only if we believe in him, you know, can we receive this promise. Okay. So that is again talking about the mess. It's a messianic prophecy. It's talking about Jesus coming. Okay. And, and because he came and dies, dies on the cross, you know, all the nations will be blessed. Are you all with me? Yes. Okay, we look at the third uh, prophecy about concerning uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Can somebody read that, please? Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Pharaoh was furious with his servants, and he put me in conf confinement in the house of Kim. Can you please read that loudly? Genesis 49, verse 10, please. The scepter shall not depart from the Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Sheol comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Okay, so here we see that Judah inherited, uh, you know, as uh, the firstborn inheritance to be the leader. Okay, and uh, God promised that through Judah, the kings will come out of the tribe of Judah. So the leadership position among all the brothers, uh, you know, was given to Judah, which meant that 
you know, eventually the kings of Israel would come from the tribe of Judah. And we also see that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. Jesus is called as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay. So it's fulfilling this prophecy that was um, revealed. So the Messiah, God's ultimate leader, okay, the king would eventually come from the tribe of Judah. So this prophecy clearly foretells the coming of a particular king who is Christ, who is Jesus Christ himself. So in the Old Testament um, times, you know, Shiloh was a city where the tabernacle of God was kept to set. Okay, we read that in Joshua chapter 18, verse 1. And, um, you know, um, this, this city of Shiloh was destroyed was later destroyed, we read it in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 12 to 14. But if you look at uh, the meaning of this word Shiloh, there are two words, shell and low. Okay, Shiloh, two words, shell and low, uh, which means uh, to whom it belongs. So the word Shiloh means to whom it belongs. So if you basically read the sentence in this verse, it says, the, script, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, okay, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until the one comes to whom it belongs. Okay, so instead of saying Shiloh, we read it as until the one comes to whom it belongs. So who does it belong to? The rule, the scepter. Scepter means, you know, what is the power? You know, it's rule, authority. Okay, so who does this scepter belong to? Jesus Christ. Okay, so Jesus came out of the tribe of Judah. We read also this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14. Um, and so it's referring to how Jesus would come as the ultimate king. And here, the last phrase, and to him shall the obedience of the people. Okay, the last phrase talks about and to him shall be the obedience of the people, uh, which is here talking about, uh, you know, the prophecy referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Okay, the first part of the prophecy is talking about the incarnation, the Messiah coming. Okay, the second, uh, the last phrase is talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. It, when it says, to him shall the obedience of the people be uh, in one of the versions, it says, unto him shall the gathering of the people be, or that the nations will obey him. So all the nations who obey him, when Jesus comes a second time, they will all be gathered up unto him. Okay? Be gathered up to him. So this is um, the third messianic prophecy that's talking about the incarnation of Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 49, verse uh, 10. Any questions so far? Online students? Genesis 49 verse 10, we're talking about, you know, Jesus, to, Jesus will belong all authority. Okay. The next prophecy that we look at is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 and 18. Um, the, the Messiah would come would be a prophet like Moses. So can one of you please read that? Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses uh, 15 and 18 please the lord your god will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst from your uh, brethren him you shall hear i will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that i command him okay thank you so here, if you look at the word prophet, it's a capital P, okay? It's referring to uh, Jesus Christ. How do we know this? Because the Apostle Paul, when he talks, uh, you know, give it, he's giving his sermon, not the sermon after the Pentecost, but the sermon in Acts chapter 3, uh, he reveals to us that this prophet, prophet referred uh, to in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 18, verse 15 and 18 is Jesus Christ. So if you look at Acts chapter 3, verses 20 to 26, okay, 
uh, we're not going to read it, but uh, it's basically he's talking about the prophet and he's saying this prophet is whom? Jesus Christ. Okay. So how do we know that this, uh, this uh, uh, prophecy here mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 8, which is talking about a prophet, you know, with a capital P is Jesus Christ uh, was what was revealed to Peter when he speaks his sermon in Acts chapter 3. You can read that in verses 22. Um, 26 okay also we see uh, in john chapter 3 verse 34 that um, the apostle john testifies that jesus is the messiah that we are looking for when he uh, says in john chapter 3 verse 34 so can somebody read that please john chapter 3 verse 34 for he who has for he whom god has sent speaks the word of god for God does not give the spirit by measures. For God gives the spirit without limit. Okay. But here it says, so the one who God has sent speaks the word of God. Okay. So what is the promise here in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18? He says, you know, I will, God says, I will put my words in his mouth, which is talking about the his is here referring to the prophet is referring to Jesus Christ. He says he will speak to them all that I command him. That's why Jesus, you know, frequently we see and read in the gospel. Jesus says, I only say what I hear my father say. Okay, it's going back to this prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, uh, verse um, 18. Okay, the next prophecy uh, concerning the incarnation of Jesus Christ is uh, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 and Isaiah 9, verse 6 where it uh, is revealed to us that a virgin shall bear a son. Okay, so can somebody else read that, please? Isaiah 7, 14 and Isaiah 9, 6. So here, you look very clear, uh, you know, carefully. It says that you know, there'll be a sign given and a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So even though, and look at the son, it's a capital S, not a small S, capital S. But even though there were prophecies concerning the Messiah that, you know, he'll be born of a virgin, you know, he'll born, be born as a baby. Uh, what was his name called? But in, in you know, in spite of that, you know, the, they failed to look, they overlooked or they failed to look at these prophecies and consider these prophecies which were talking about the Messiah. Okay. Isaiah 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Okay. Yes, we looked at this, uh, uh, you know, two familiar passages which we keep reading during uh, Christmas time, you know, which foretells the birth of Jesus Christ. And these prophecies were given 700 years before its fulfillment. And we see it's fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. The next prophecy is he will come from Bethlehem. We already looked at this. Micah, Micah chapter 5 verse 2. Can somebody read that please? But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathan, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, who is going forth uh, from of old, from everlasting. Okay, thank you. So here we see that, um, you know, um, this prophecy was fulfilled in Christ's coming out of Judah. We read this in Matthew chapter 2, verses one to six okay um but when herod had called the people and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and he asked them where this messiah was going to be born what do they say in bethlehem in judea okay uh, they replied because they said this is what the prophet has written so this is what the prophet isaiah has written uh, so, you know, Herod wanted to know after wise men came and they, they wanted to know where this king would be born. And so he called all the priests and the teachers of the law and asked them and they said in Bethlehem in Judea. Okay. And we see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in 
Judea, so it was fulfilled. And it says, who's going forth are from of old, from everlasting. So Jesus is uh, the Messiah who is from everlasting, eternally, eternity past to eternity future. We already studied this in our first chapter. Remember this, this thing that we read and um, studied in chapter one? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, another prophecy that talks about that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem uh, and we see its uh, fulfillment happening as we look in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 6, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea. And also the chief priests and the teachers um, of the law as, uh, testified to this fact that the king was, or the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem in Judea. Okay, the next pro prophecy is uh, in Zechariah chapter 9. Verse 9. So, can somebody read Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, please? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He just and having salvation, lowly and reading on a donkey, he called the fall of a donkey. Thank you. So, here it's talking about Jesus' triumphal entry into, into Jerusalem. Okay. Remember, they put him on a donkey and then they spread their cloaks and their clothes and they wave uh, palm branches. So uh, did that take place? And Jesus, uh, you know, uh, during Jesus' time here on earth, did it take place? Yes. But this was a prophecy that was told or revealed 400 years before its fulfillment. And we see that Jesus did enter Jerusalem just before his, you know, he was uh, taken away and crucified. You know, uh, we see him entering Jerusalem, riding on a donkey's colt, uh, and we see this fulfilled, and uh, we read about this in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11, okay? But before it happened, it was already prophesied 400 years prior to it uh, by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, okay? The next prophecy in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, can somebody else read, please? Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to, he, to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, saying the Lord of hosts. So Jesus quotes um, uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 10, uh, it says, This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus basically speaks this. We see him saying this in Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. But as he's saying this, he's basically quoting what the prophet Malachi prophesied and we read about in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. So who is this messenger? Behold, I send my messenger, John the Baptist. Okay. Who is the my? Behold, I send my messenger. God is saying, because I send my messenger. Okay. So John the Baptist was the messenger who would prepare the way for whom? Jesus Christ. Okay. So uh, we see this in, um, you know, we, we look at uh, other references to this uh, prophecy in uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Luke chapter 1, verse um, 76, and uh, John chapter 1, verse 23. So can somebody read verse uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, please, loudly, clearly for us? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Okay. So here it says a voice of one calling in the wilderness. So who is that who was in the wilderness? You know, John the Baptist. Uh, we see this also. I read this in Genesis. Sorry, John chapter 1 verse 23. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet. John himself attesting to the prophet Isaiah and what was written in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. He says, I am that voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. So what John is saying is, hey, the prophet Isaiah prophesied. We read this in Isaiah 40 verse 3 and he says, you know, 
uh, John is saying, I am that, uh, uh, you know, I am that voice of the one who's calling the desert, make straight the way of the Lord. Okay. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Can somebody read this? Okay. <laughs> okay. So here, I, uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 76. Um, you know, it says here, I knew my child would be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for um, him. Okay, so basically in Luke chapter 1 verse, um, verse 76, you know, um, it is his, um, uh, John the Baptist's father, uh, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he's, you know, prophesying, okay, and when he prophesies, he's basically uh, quoting uh, the scripture about the, ch the child, um, you know, uh, who would go forth and prepare the way of the Lord before him, which is referring to John the Baptist. Okay. Um, also, we see that, you know, um, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come. So we look at the first half of this prophecy. Okay. Uh, behold, I send my messenger. We looked at who the messenger is. We, we looked at it as John the Baptist. We saw the prophecies concerning John the Baptist, the messenger in the Old Testament. We saw its fulfillment in the New Testament in Luke chapter 1 verse 76 and John chapter 1 verse 23. Now the latter half of Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, he says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Okay, so is was this prophecy also fulfilled? Yes, when? When Jesus suddenly comes to the temple uh, in John chapter 2 verses 14 and 15, he comes to the temple and he sees all of them, you know, running their business, they're having stalls, selling animals for sacrifice, money changers, ch you know, changing the money uh, because people are coming from various parts of the world uh, for the Passover feast and uh, buying the uh, animals for sacrifice. And Jesus was so angry because they were making his the, uh, the house of his father a marketplace and a den of thieves where they were robbing people, which means in the market, if a dove was sold for say 10 rupees, they would sell it here for 15 rupees. Okay, and they would, uh, you know, actually um, fleas or, uh, you know, cheat these poor travelers because they wouldn't have time to run to the market and come and, you know, so they just buy from the temple and Jesus was so angry, he, put, he clears the temple, okay? So the prophecy also here we read that is fulfilled where he will suddenly come into the temple and then even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now, um, this, this prophecy about Jesus coming, what is he saying? That the messenger of the covenant, so Jesus was the one who initiated the, the new covenant, right? He initiated the new covenant, uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to 13, where Jesus is spoken of as the mediator of the new covenant. So can somebody uh, read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to 13, please? But now he has obtained a no excellent ministry uh, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been full, uh, full place, then no place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made, with their fathers in the day when I, I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I just I discreted them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be there. God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, 
from the least of them to the greatest of them for i will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins uh, and their lawless deeds i will remember no more and that he says a new covenant he has made the first absolved new uh, now what is uh, can, absolute yes absolute 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 and growing old is ready to when is away okay thank you amen to that so here we see here very clearly it says but in fact the ministry jesus has received is a superior to theirs as a covenant of which he is the mediator which is a, he's a mediator mediator means he initiated brought about the which covenant the new covenant i think that is uh, be careful i think your hand is static that is why you are uh, getting a shock okay uh, so is the media i think you can put off that mic because he's getting a shock uh, can you just put it off here huh oh can you take that from him uh, chirag otherwise he'll get a shock can you take it yeah be careful okay so um so jesus is the mediator of the new covenant the new covenant is much superior to the old covenant and it's established on better promises and also talks about here you know um, how it is a superior covenant where god himself is going to write it in the hearts and minds of people he will be their god they will be his people and he will teach his um, people so jesus we see is the is the mediator of the or initiator the one who brought about his new covenant how did he bring about his new covenant when he died on the cross for us since he paid the full and made the full sufficient perfect sacrifice he initiated the new covenant so we are part of the new covenant which is based on new uh, promises okay so here we see this um, this whole prophecy here in micah chapter 3 verse 1 which talking about john the baptist which is talking about jesus coming to the temple and also about the the covenant which jesus is a mediator of the new covenant was fulfilled all in uh, when jesus was born and when he lived here on the earth okay any questions yes please take the mic and ask so that our online students can also hear so here the messenger of the covenant it uh, refers to both uh, john the baptist and also jesus christ so messenger of the covenant is it refers to both the people like both even the people. messenger of the covenant uh, yeah see if you look at that's what you need to see the verse look at the verse what is the how is the first messenger mentioned small m second It's capital M. Yes, messenger of the covenant talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. Anyone else has any other questions? Yes, Nina. Uh, uh actually, I'm going back to the Abrahamic covenant. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the thing is, uh, in uh, Genesis twelve three, when uh, God told Abraham that. all the families of the earth would be blessed through him through him or through his seed so genesis 22 18 which is um, is that just clarifying this because there are also mention of uh, your descendants descendants will be like the stars in the sky and you know so yes through jesus yes which is clarified in galatians again that all it is going to happen through jesus but the descendants are all those who believe isn't it the descendants of abraham because it says that all those who are of faith are blessed with believing i mean like abraham yes you're absolutely so, right yes yeah okay so descendants are also talking about all the people who are going to be coming to believe uh, the promise to abraham is that in because first he says in you all the families of the earth will be blessed and that was again clarified in 2218 genesis when it says seed is mentioned and then again it's clarified in galatians saying who the seed is but then the descendants would be all those who believe right yes all those who believe who put believe their in god this christ yeah. yes okay thank you we see how beautifully uh, 
you know, God has even pre, pre, preordained, you know, that the gen it's not only the Jews, uh, his uh -huh. chosen people that he wants to, you know, uh, uh, to know him and uh, be part of this blessing, but also the nations around. So we know that mm -hmm. God is not a partial God. He incorporates also other nations. He was also wants them to know him as their Lord and Savior. And also he knows in the future this will be a problem because, you know, the Gentiles will come to faith. And so how can they receive the blessing? So here it is talking about, uh, you know, all those who come to faith uh, because uh, uh, Abraham was justified by faith even before he received the circumcision uh, ritual, which is a sign of the covenant. The sign of the covenant was the circumcision ritual. So he was, even before he did that covenant, he was justified because of his faith. He was made righteous before God. Justified means made righteous before God. So also those, all those who believe in, in Jesus Christ, because they put their faith in him, uh, will be justified by faith and will be part of the covenant. Of course, now the new covenant that is there uh, because of their faith in Jesus Christ, but also the Abrahamic blessings. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll end class. We look at, uh, there's just one more, uh, you know, uh, uh, prophecy that we have to look at. We we'll look at it in the, in, the, in the next class. Okay. Thank you everyone for joining class and have a blessed day. God bless everybody. Thank you.